Welcome, everyone. I'm joined today by Alexander Grigoryan, an economist and associate professor at the American University of Armenia. Dr. Grigoryan, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. Uh, before we begin our conversation, I'm just wondering, could you tell us more about uh, your research and what exactly you do? Econom uh, economics is a very broad uh, field, as we, as we know. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for, for this opportunity. We, um, we have this research group working already more than 10 years with different uh, members, with different co-authors, and uh, we cover a range of uh, development topics, mostly focusing on Armenia. And the topics are migration, financial inclusion, poverty, inequality. Recently, we uh, made some efforts to develop an agenda on, on gender, uh, studying the aspects of a gender gap in, in, in different uh, contexts. And uh, for this uh, type of research, uh, we have been collaborating with, uh, uh, with the Stockholm School of Economics, uh, being involved in kind of uh, initiatives uh, which is uh, uh, at, at, at the European level. Apart from that, uh, what we do, we, we are quite, uh, quite active in uh, trying to uh, develop uh, different studies in, in the perspective of uh, multidimensional deprivation, like looking at uh, multidimensional deprivation from labor markets, labor market opportunities, uh, the classical multidimensional deprivation from poverty and other types of deprivation. Uh, so to sum up, we try to capture the uh, development, different development aspects of uh, uh, economy. And as I said, uh, most of this research is uh, on, on, on the Armenian economy and, and the region. Okay, great. So. I'm wondering, it's been uh, something of a wild year for Armenia's economy. At first, uh, economists were forecasting strong negative spillovers from the war in Ukraine and, and everything related to that. Uh, but actually, what we've seen this year is double-digit growth in Armenia. So I'm wondering, in broad terms, can you assess what uh, the past economic year has been like for Armenia? Uh, indeed, it was uh, very hard to, to predict what will be, what will happen uh, in, in Armenia uh, since the start of uh, the Russian-Ukraine war. And uh, yeah, the, the expectation was that uh, Armenia will fall into recession and, uh, you know, these traditional ties, economic and uh, also geopolitical ties with, with Russia, uh, would predict that uh, we would go into a very unpredictable, in, in, in a negative sense, uh, phase of uh, development. But we have seen uh, the opposite. The influx of uh, Russian capital and labor has changed the landscape of the uh, economic development. And uh, that, the, the, in any case, it should be perceived as, as a shock. I mean, right now we have a, a positive part of the shock, positive aspect of this shock. But still, uh, the, I think the, uh, the economics uh, community and also policymakers are uh, quite uh, uh, careful in describing this, this shock as a uh, positive in, 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 in an ultimate sense. So we don't really know what to expect uh, next year, even next year's because uh, the, the war, uh, the conflict uh, in, in, in Europe uh, seems to be long lived. And uh, I think uh, the, uh, the, the shocks in, in also in negative terms are yet, yet to come. So what, what happened uh, at the beginning of the year the uh, international organizations, also the Armenian government, uh, expected to have almost uh, zero rate for economic growth and uh, increase in poverty and inequality. But as, as you said, uh, we ended up with a, a very high uh, economic growth, uh, though the growth has not been uh, actually uh, effectively shared with all layers of society. High inflation and uh, uh, basically no change in, in, uh, in poverty and uh, inequality uh, suggests that, uh, that this kind of growth uh, need not be uh, very effective from the inclusive perspective, from the uh, notion of inclusive growth. 
And I'm wondering, could you also talk about other structural factors that may have played a role here? What was the Armenian government doing? What major policy shifts, if any, uh, took place over the past year? Actually, we uh, we expected to have uh, major institutional changes after the Velvet Revolution in 2018, and to be uh, uh, to be honest, uh, the government didn't have, uh, let's say, uh, regular time to to pursue to its objectives. Uh, we we had uh, Nagorno-Karabakh War, 44-day war, and then. Uh, uh, that was also time for COVID. So 2020 was really hard time for 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 Armenia and uh, globally. And then uh, this year was uh, full of unexpected uh, events uh, at both global and regional levels. So it's very hard to 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 really uh, judge about the effectiveness of uh, the new government uh, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of fulfilling the promises at an institutional level. Uh, but what I uh, would, uh, or the research, uh, our research and the research team focused on, uh, are the factors that go beyond uh, the, beyond 2018, and I would like to perhaps I, I can elaborate on a couple of factors that that are relevant for uh, that we think are relevant to understand what to uh, expect for the Armenian economy. Please. Uh, so we we have done uh, several studies on on on, on migration, and uh, we all know that there have been a number of subsequent waves of emigration since the collapse of the Soviet Union, and uh, we always took this uh, this uh, this kind of vision that one has to think about where the family with some emigration moods will be unified. Is it? about uh, in, in, in the home country or in, in a host country. And our studies actually show that, uh, in general, immigration intentions are very high. And if you look at uh, a, a macroeconomic data, most of the cases, what we observe is that uh, family unification is very likely uh, to take place outside. So when you look at the balance of uh, inflows and outflows, uh, on an annual basis, uh, we observe uh, quite a uh, declining population, declining trend, trend, trend for Armenia. And what we uh, what we further explore is that uh, why immigration intentions are so high and they are continue to, they continue being high. We look at the factors of uh, political, economic, and uh, uh, geopolitical nature. And on the geopolitical side, we we focus on. Uh, security threats and uh, the data we have uh, from 2010 2013 suggests that uh, most of the emigration happens or say in terms of intentions that later on uh, actually take place in, in, in real life happens because of uh, uh, low quality and uh, negative in terms of uh, changes negative expectations in political institutions but uh, what we are, uh, what, what is worrying more is that uh, preliminary studies show that uh, actually security threat can uh, be even more dominant factor if you look at, uh, at at the recent data. But what is important from from our early study is that these are uh, the political institutions that uh, basically failed and uh, led people to think more systematically to 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 leave the country. Uh, so the concept of uh, security first and then other things should come in, like uh, political uh, institutions, economic well-being, seems to uh, be not in place when we uh, consider, again, a study back to 10, 12 years. Uh, now things can change and that's what, what we find as, as a very uh, dangerous factor, given given the ongoing developments, given the you know the invasion invasion of uh, Azerbaijan uh, in at least two three phases after the uh, uh, after the forty four day war. So uh, our major concern is that uh, you know the emigration moods are getting more responsive towards security threats rather than political and economic. Uh, uh, conditions. So this said, uh, it is very important to uh, to perhaps flip the model from 
uh, from political institutions and economic well-being to security. Rather, the model can be first security comes and then the other two dimensions. And then there are some other studies, like we look at the financial inclusion. We understand that uh, you know over indebtedness can be a major issue for many families. Uh, Financial literacy is a quite important factor to to understand uh, to understand the uh, the uh, the threat of uh, being uh, found in, uh, in in poverty trap for many families. That's another important aspect that we, we look at. In a couple of studies on gender, we see that there is pretty high uh, uh, perceptions. Uh, pretty low perceptions towards uh, gender violence uh, that typically uh, uh, should be high for, let's say, for developing countries, but uh, it is uh, much lower here. And there are some economic consequences in terms of uh, in terms of gender gap in in uh, uh, in, in in labor market, uh, in education, and and other dimensions. Great. Um... <clears throat> I'm wondering if we could look forward now at uh, the upcoming year and in the near future. I know it's difficult to make predictions, especially with everything you're saying about security. As we're speaking right now, Karabakh is under blockade, so these developments are happening very quickly. But in terms of structural trends, where do you see Armenia's economy moving forward next year? Uh... I think it's it's not going to be uh, very new to say that education is very important. Uh, on the other hand, investing in education uh, today would mean to to expect uh, changes in uh, maybe five years, ten years. So, if we look at the factors that are fundamental uh, and they will bring some quality changes, it will take some time. It's, it's about education, it's about investing in financial literacy, it's about uh, uh, addressing some of the issues that could mitigate uh, gender gap, uh, etc. Uh, it, is, it is very hard to say what the uh, government should do today or say uh, in the next year to try to uh, increase the resilience of the economy towards these different types of shocks. Uh, but uh, kind of loudly thinking about uh, this direction, one can say that uh, we need to provide systematic signals that it's not only about uh, at a political stage to talk about uh, uh, expectations or, or, or changes that would uh, result in uh, result in favorable outcomes and not bringing some disaster in. Uh, 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 within the relationship uh, of uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, and you know the, uh, the the problem that now we encounter related to Zangezur corridor, and as you said, uh, now uh, Nagorno-Karabakh is blockaded, but also to take uh, to take rather aggressive steps to 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 reveal to reveal the. Uh, the raising power of, of, of the military for, for, for Armenia. And uh, that could be in different ways. That could be investing in, uh, investing in uh, hard technologies. Uh, so I, I'm more thinking of uh, delivering signals that we take on. Uh, that we, it doesn't mean that uh, tomorrow we are going to be ready for uh, large-scale uh, military clash. I'm not talking about that, but at least uh, what we try to, what we should try to deliver is that uh, we are aware of uh, the very hard situation, and we are not investing in infrastructures that are not, on one or the other way, uh, uh, related to uh, to the increase of military res resilience of the country. So I, I would say that the Armenian government should be uh, should not afraid of taking steps that maybe are not that populistic from the political perspective, from the political economy perspective, but uh, instead uh, investing 
in terms of efforts, in terms of uh, resources to increase the military resilience and also to be very active in, uh, uh, in uh, going for global cooperation on, again on, on, on the area of military, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, again, maybe that, that, that can sound very strange that an economist is talking about uh, this kind of things, but uh, as an economist, uh, I, I, I'm very aware of uh, the relevance of expectations. So you need to form expectations for, uh, for your own society, for, for, uh, uh, for the global, uh, with your partners, or with your, you know, also with, with international organizations to, uh, to be consistent on your actions that you are taking today uh, and what they are expecting to see in terms of the uh, outcomes. So I think uh, the, 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 the number one uh, objective for the Armenian government is to form expectations that today we are investing, that tomorrow, even in one hour, we are getting uh, more powerful than what we have now. So that should be, that should be uh, the message and, uh, and re given the uh, limited resources that uh, any country has and particularly Armenia, uh, one has to be very careful in uh, identifying the, 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 the sectors, uh, the areas in which you do capital investments. So that will be my message. Otherwise, to, you know, to, to try to uh, envisage what will happen next year, it is going to be very hard. You are not going to, as a government, you are not going to uh, be very ready what will uh, happen if Russians will leave the country or there will be capital outflows and so forth. But instead you can uh, at least commit uh, on, on the sides of your actions that you are investing in certain directions to increase, again, the resilience of, uh, from the military perspective. Uh, before, we, before we wrap up, I also wanted to ask you about Armenia-Turkey economic relations. I, uh, I understand that you've studied this in the past. Uh, Ruben Rubin Yan Yerevan's special envoy to Ankara announced recently that air cargo services with Turkey uh, are expected to be launched very soon. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't have an exact date yet for that. But what can you tell us about Armenia's economic relations with Turkey and what may change if the border opens, even partially? Uh, we, we had this study uh, before the Nagorno-Karabakh war and uh, the main, uh, the main uh, conclu conclusion from the policy perspective uh, was that the Armenian government should be uh, more systematic in its uh, strategic policies, in its strategies uh, to help the Armenian businessmen uh, make the business with uh, Turkish partners more effective. Mm. So what we observed is that, and I think I had this discussion in, in civil net in uh, a year before. So what we observed is that uh, the Armenian businessmen have been very uh, unhappy uh, the way uh, they would expect that the Armenian government helps them in administrative uh, issues uh, as well as uh, in uh, promoting their products. So in one or the other way, facilitating the, the, the trade. Uh, something that actually uh, they could observe uh, from the Turkey side. So that kind of concern was, uh, again, relative to what uh, the uh, Turkish government uh, has in terms of strategies and uh, that was the main, uh, let's say, uh, uh, conclusion, conclusive, uh, also recommended statement that we have in, in that study. Otherwise, uh, the Armenians, I mean, those who have been in, in business with, with Turkey, they, they, they were quite happy in terms of business-to-business uh, uh, -business, uh, relationship, the way the business goes on. Uh, so the economic perspective uh, can be pretty fine, uh, but uh, I see another kind of uh, threat that, you know, uh, whenever Armenia has a talk with Turkey and uh, that talk is pretty separate from what kind of uh, 
interaction, I don't want to even to say uh, negotiation, but interaction with Azerbaijan, it can be in terms of direct talk, in terms of uh, intervention uh, of uh, Azerbaijani troops to, to, to Armenia. Uh, when you separate the two, uh, the, 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 the two processes, uh, and you have behind this uh, perfect coordination between Turkey and Azerbaijan, uh, Armenia loses its monopoly or any kind of, I don't even say, uh, negotiation power to, uh, to get uh, an outcome that is favorable for, for Armenia. In, in, in the way that whenever you do a commitment, let's say uh, you have a commitment with, with, uh, with Turkey, then uh, the state changes, uh, let's say, on the Azerbaijani side, but then you have to fulfill this commitment with Turkey. So uh, Armenian uh, negotiators are going to be in trouble not fulfilling subsequent commitments with Turkey, trying to explain that something was going on on the Azerbaijani side, that's why we are not going. So in fact, everything becomes contingent on the Armenia-Azerbaijani uh, relations it can be again in terms of negotiation in terms of you know some conflict escalation uh, and it, it's going to it's going to uh, create a major challenge I would say impediment to reach out uh, to any kind of consensus or agreement with with, with Turkey mm -hmm. so I would uh, uh, definitely uh, think about another kind of uh, uh, negotiation table uh, that can be three of uh, the country representatives talk to each other maybe Russia comes in but this separate kind of thing that happens and Armenia becomes very sensitive to what's going on on the Armenia Azerbaijan border becomes uh, uh, kind of uncontrollable for in terms of the outcome for Armenia well dr. Gigurian thank you very thank you again very much for your time thank you thank you Mark. and thank you for joining us on civil net if you like the work that we do and want to support our independent journalism, please consider going to our website and clicking the donate button at the top of your screen. Every dollar helps our reporters continue their crucial work in Armenia and Karabakh. Thank you.